A drunken washerwoman when submerged. Though Holland argued all along that it was just inexperience on the man at the helm. The original Holland had the rudder's forward propeller, like a modern nuclear boat. But during trials, she did not behave very well, rather sluggish. So John Holland was forced to put all that structure on the stern in order to get the rudders aft of the propeller. Once they had a successful submarine, the Holland Torpedo Boat Company, which had by now become the Electric Boat Company, basically removed the inventor and started to market the submarines to get a return on investment for their stockholders. Holland was fired, but the tide of technology had turned. Weapon and platform had come together, and the combination was about to prove lethal. Yet Holland's vision of the submarine was ahead of its time. He has written that he felt this was a weapon to end all wars. He felt the submarine would make wars obsolete because nobody could find it, nobody could stop it, and therefore, naval battles wouldn't occur. For now, nothing could be further from the truth. Britain, the world's superpower, embraced Holland's revolutionary boat. In 1901, the British Navy commissioned their own Holland I. It was the ultimate irony. In Britain, the key player here was Admiral Sir John Fisher, who specifically left the Admiralty in 1902 and went down to be Commander-in-Chief at Portsmouth so he could oversee the introduction of the first submarine flotillas and actually have a hands-on role in developing the submarine from a local defense vessel into a seagoing, later an ocean-going instrument. It's interesting because the two men that have serious thoughts about how submarines will be used in the next war, Holland and Fisher, Holland doesn't live to see what happens, and Fisher does. Fisher was quite right. He said, this will change the way that we fight, this will transform war, and people will do really diabolical things with them. They will sink unarmed merchant ships on the high seas with them. In August 1914, Britain went to war with Germany. The silent service was about to make an explosive debut. First and most stunning success for the submarine in the First World War came when the German submarine U-9, commanded by Otto Weddingen, sank three large British cruisers off the Dutch coast. They were so surprised by what happened that when the first one was hit and started to go down, the other two closed in, stopped, and launched their boats to rescue survivors, and they too in succession were torpedoed and sunk. This attack was a signal that the weapon of the underdog had finally arrived. It propelled naval warfare into a new era. U-boat commanders realized stealth was a key element to their operations, so they discarded the rules of engagement laid down by the 1856 treaty, known as the Declaration of Paris. In order to capture a ship legitimately, you had to stop it on the open seas, you had to board it, inspect its papers, and you had to allow the crew and the passengers good opportunity to escape from the ship before you sank it. These were the so-called cruiser rules, and they governed how war at sea should be fought. They were, of course, far too civilized for the First World War, which was nasty, brutal, and total. The important novelty in the way the Germans used their submarines against a British and Allied trade in 1915 when they declared a war zone and unrestricted submarine warfare was that submarines would act in a way that nobody ever thought they would before the war. That is, shooting on sight, not picking up survivors. And this was what the Germans began to do. And the combination of the submarine used in this previously utterly inhumane way, as it was thought, proved an extremely effective instrument indeed. And in a context where Britain was expanding the blockade items which it wasn't allowing into Germany to cover almost everything, including food, the Germans thought they had the right of retaliation. 
But the unrestricted warfare tactics of the German Navy ensured a grim roll call of innocent victims. The Cunard liner Lusitania was carrying neutral Americans when she was torpedoed by the U-20 off the coast of Ireland on May 7, 1915. Over a thousand lives were lost. The Lusitania story is an essential part of World War I. It has all the elements of the Titanic disaster, all the romance of the rich and famous going down with the ship. And the Lusitania really stratified anti-German sentiment in Britain and the United States. It's a contributing factor, at least, to the American involvement in World War I. The submarine was tearing up the rules of war, threatening the British Navy's superiority and its previously unassailable command of the seas, so vital for an island nation. In 1917, a renewed German U-boat campaign had very nearly brought Britain to her knees. The key to the success of the German submarines in the First World War isn't any technological superiority. Their boats might have been slightly better made, and their diesel engines were probably of a higher quality than the British engines. But the basic German U-boat and the British submarine of the First World War were not very far apart in performance. It's just much easier to be a successful submariner if you're attacking the world's oceanic shipping, which is very numerous, uh, unescorted, whereas British submarines are trying to attack fleeting targets which are moving at high speed and well defended, essentially German warships. The solution was to reintroduce the age-old standby of a convoy, merchant shipping escorted by warships in collective groups. And this blunted the German submarine offensive, rendered it far less effective, and enabled the Allies to survive at sea while they brought over immense numbers of American troops and basically ground the German army into the dust on the Western Front in 1918. After the war, the victorious Allies banned U boat construction. Undeterred, the Germans continued to develop submarines in a clandestine design bureau in the Netherlands. When Adolf Hitler took control in 1933, he approved plans to once again construct U-boats. 24 were being built by the end of 1935. The Germans knew exactly what they wanted for their submarines. They were going out to hunt down our merchant ships. For that, they wanted speed on the surface. They knew they would have to go through very rough weather. They knew they were going to be attacked with depth charges. They were going to go in harm's way. They built their submarines from the very start under Admiral Donitz from 1935 on for war and war alone. Karl Donitz, the German submarine leader, had innovative ideas about U-boat operations. His strategy was a ruthless submarine campaign that made use of radio communications to guide multiple U-boats to their prey. 1935, when he's designated as uh, Commander-in-Chief U-Boats, he experimented with, with radio communications again to develop what is widely referred to as Wolf Pack, but to the Germans is known as Rudel Taktik, literally meaning group tactics. When one U-boat spotted a convoy, it shadowed at a safe distance and called other U-boats into position by radio. Designed for fast surface running, the U-boats raced to their intended victims. When enough were assembled, the pack would pounce under cover of darkness. The early months of World War II were known to the German crews as their happy time because of the largely unopposed wolf pack tactics in the Atlantic. The U-boat's coordinated use of radio was devastating. 
but the Allies countered with audio technology of their own. The twin inventions of radio.